Hey everybody, this is Aubrey Chavez from Faith Matters. For today's episode, we brought on Latter-day Saint philosopher and theologian Adam Miller to talk about his book, An Early Resurrection. Not only did we think that this would be the perfect conversation for the Easter holiday, but we recently read the book and we were left with so much to think about after reading Adam's really unique and powerful insights on the topic of death and resurrection. We'll let the conversation speak for itself in terms of the power of the ideas of the book, but here's a little teaser from the book's description. Along with Nephi, we talk of Christ, we rejoice in Christ, we preach of Christ. But in all our talking and learning, have we learned how to live in Christ? What does a life in Christ look like or feel like? How can we let ourselves and our own desires die so that we can be born again to a new life, a full life in Christ, here and now, in this mortal life? And for those who aren't familiar with Adam yet, he's a professor of philosophy at Collin College in McKinney, Texas. He earned a BA in comparative literature from Brigham Young University and an MA and PhD in philosophy from Villanova University. He is the author of several books, including the one that we're talking about in this episode, as well as another of our favorites, Letters to a Young Mormon, which was published in 2018 by Desert Book and the Maxwell Institute at BYU. Thanks so much for listening. We really hope that you enjoy this conversation with Adam Miller as much as we did. All right, Adam Miller, thank you so much for joining us again on the podcast. My pleasure. Yeah, we appreciate you being here. Um, we are very excited about this conversation. Um, we've recently read your book, um, An Early Resurrection. Uh, this, is, this is an Easter episode, and so we thought that, we thought that the topic was certainly timely. Um, but the approach that you take is, uh, is just remarkably insightful and different than, than anything I'd, I'd ever read you know, on the topic of, of resurrection. Um, I, wa- I wanted to start out by asking, and many of our listeners will know this, but you're a college professor. Um, you, I know you think and write a lot on topics that might be considered somewhat esoteric by, by some you know, uh, contemporary French uh, philosophy, uh, theological topics. But this, this book is deeply devotional in a lot of ways. It felt like you really you know, poured your soul out into this book. Uh, could you talk about maybe where this where this book came from, where the spark was, and how how it originated? Well, this book I think written in the same vein, in the same spirit as uh, letters to a young Mormon yes. for a kind of you know for a general audience of Latter Day Saints. So certainly informed by you know the work that I do as a scholar, but it's not it's not a straightforwardly scholarly book. Uh, I'm curious about what what struck you as as deeply personal about it. I mean, it's not as if there's a lot of biographical content. Yeah, uh, but uh, it does have a kind of personal tone. What what struck you as personal about it? I can tell you. Can I volunteer? Jump in. The parts where you're talking about what's mundane, like those, seem incredibly personal. Like these very just like regular day experiences that get sort of collapsed into the sacred, like that felt like we were, you know, in your life. And it was, it was just very relatable in a way that felt personal to me. And so I, I think it felt like I was just sort of like sitting with you in these like daily meditations, like how something very normal can actually be this like real gateway to a life in Christ. And so, yeah, it felt, I I had that same impression. It felt like very, very personal. Yeah, I think, yeah, I have sort of two things. The first one is similar to yours, Aubrey, but the way you talked about uh, approaching work, approaching relationship with your family, approaching, yeah, like Aubrey said, those sort of mundane tasks. Like I was thinking about, um, and this is something I've been working on sort of over the past year, and I can't remember if you used this example particularly, but like how, how does one approach doing the dishes? You know, how does one approach mowing the lawn? And you talked about those things and there is a there are radically different ways and i want to get into this for sure to approach those things that change completely uh the way that you experience them and then the other thing that struck me as really devotional about it was the the number of both the number of repetitions of the word christ that you used um and the sort of matter of fact way in which you used it like the how you kept coming back to that that word and that concept of Christ obviously came, was coming from a place of deep faith, um, per, you know perhaps and you, and you could you could illuminate this, but perhaps informed by scholarship, but it certainly seemed to me not uh, entirely in, informed by it. Yeah, that's that's good. That's helpful. I think 
I think there is that kind of uh, persistent focus on Christ showing up in the ordinary and the mundane stuff of life that certainly gives it a kind of personal flavor insofar as the, the stuff that lives are made of is mostly ordinary, everyday yeah. stuff. Yeah. Uh, combined, I think, with a sort of, with a sort of maybe confessional um, type tone. Uh, both in the sense of of my confessing weaknesses, but both in the sense and also in the sense of you know confessing simultaneously Christ, yes, uh, experienced in the confession of those weaknesses. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. You know, really, the thing that uh, that compelled me to write this book as I did it has to do with uh, there's that line and in the opening verses of Enos where after he uh, wrestles with the Lord and receives forgiveness, uh, he, he responds, <laughs> he responds to the uh, extension of forgiveness by asking, uh, Lord, how is it done? How is it done? He just did it. And he's not hundred percent sure <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> about how this just happened. Yeah. Uh, and in lots of ways that's, you know, both, both as a scholar and as, just a disciple that's the question that drives me how is it done yeah. at resurrection how how is it done not just in the future maybe but but early right here right yeah. now forgiveness how is it done love how how do i do it uh life in christ as paul describes it uh how do i take that from being a kind of uh, a theoretical projection of some future happy state how do i how do i do it Yes. Um, and that for me is kind of a, a very driving practical question where, where uh, things that we talk about all the time really, really come to life. Yeah. I want to, I want to ask this question early um, because I think we've sort of touched on it, but the way in which you use the word Christ potentially implied to me something different than a focus on the the person of the person of Jesus, um, especially you know, especially in his mortal form as a you know rabbi that lived a couple thousand years ago. And maybe that is what you meant by it. But I, I want to ask that question: what What do you actually mean when you use the word Christ and you know life in Christ? You know, so many times throughout this book. Yeah, I don't want to imply any kind of theoretical or conceptual difference between the person of Jesus and, and Christ. Uh, but for me, as a mere mortal here in the 21st century, first world, uh, there is an experiential gap, right, between my experience of Christ and my experience of Jesus. My experience of Jesus is, is limited almost entirely to stories that I read in translation that are thousands of years old. And I love those stories and I, I read them continually. Uh, uh, but Christ, uh, that's a name more strongly associated for me with, with something that I'm experiencing, not reading about, right? It's something more in the vein of, of what Paul describes as the body of Christ, where that body of Christ, as it continues to persist in the world, as it's present here and now for you and me, is in some really very real sense, you and me, right? We are that body of Christ. Uh, and so especially in a book like this, uh, I think you're right that when I use the word Christ, I'm emphasizing that kind of, that, that experience of Christ, the way that he manifests, the way that something Christic or messianic or salvific uh, manifests right here and now in in my life as an extension of his body. So, do you think that this is something that you know this is our word for that experience? And and in wisdom traditions outside of our own religions and wisdom traditions outside of our own, is there another word for that for that experience? Yeah, I expect there are there are all manner of of different words for this. Insofar as uh, as we're all trying to describe 
I think what is kind of a shared fundal, a shared fundamental experience of of God, right? As God is 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 showing up right here, right now in our experiences. Yeah. Um, whether we, you know, whether whether those code for us in a way that's Christian or or Hindu or Buddhist, uh, I'm optimistic enough, I think, uh, to say that there's there's a kind of common ground there that has to do with with being a human period, uh, being a human being. Period. I think where where God keeps showing Himself in those ways. I'd love to have you read a little bit. Um, there's a chapter. One of my favorite parts where I felt like this kind of started to click for me was um, in the third chapter, you, you sort of equate this idea of life in Christ with the experience of being in love and how um, it sort of is an orientation. It's a, it's a way that, you know, you may, you talk about, you may have the same job and be with the same people and eat the same food. But when you're in love, this experience is so, is so deeply transformative everything feels different even though you may be going through the same motions and that just felt like a that felt like a really useful metaphor for what you're describing about a life in Christ so I wonder if you could just read for us maybe that paragraph after this yeah where you talk about being in love where it's is that paragraph an early it. resurrection life in Christ before you die right and and kind of the the image at the heart of the book is is the idea that there's a very real sense in which our resurrection begins now here in this life before we die right and there's a very real sense in which uh, our redemption uh, our salvation is something that takes hold right here and now in the present moment and that paul uh, in the new testament characteristically describes this life this new life that takes hold now before we even leave this world uh, he describes that as life in christ right such that instead of attempting to live my life as I normally would in myself, on my own terms, in light of my own goals, um, I now live my life in Christ, on his terms, seeking his mind, seeking his will, seeking to do what he would want, um, seeking, to have, seeking to be his body, as we put it earlier. Um, and in lots of ways, as you, as you just indicated, that leads to a very different sort of life but in lots of ways, it doesn't lead to a different sort of life at all. <laughs> yeah. you, you find yourself doing all the ordinary, normal things that you were doing uh, before. You're still doing the dishes and you're still mowing the lawn and you still have to grade the papers and you still have to uh, put the kids to bed. And all those normal things are still part of it. But, but there's a kind of shift, a kind of fundamental change in how you're going about doing those things uh, that signals Christ's involvement now uh, rather than just that later at some point after judgment day or at judgment day or something like that. So I'm after in this passage, a kind of preliminary description of just what that feels like. It goes like this. Life in Christ is like this. In Christ, the way I live, my manner of living is changed from the inside out. Like being in love, living in Christ changes what it means to be alive. Living in Christ, I carry myself differently. I desire differently. I love differently. I greet pain and loss differently. I fail differently. I succeed differently. I part with the past differently. I respond to the present differently. I look to the future differently. In Christ, I hold time itself in a very different way. What then makes life in Christ different from just being alive? Almost nothing. The difference is that alive in Christ, I stop looking beyond my life for something other than life. I stop looking past my life for something special or mysterious. I stop being blind to the life I'm already living. What Jacob says about scripture is even more true about life. Wherefore, because of their blindness, which blindness came by looking beyond the mark, they must needs fall. For God hath taken away his plainness from them and delivered unto them many things which they cannot understand because they desired it. In Christ, I stop desiring what I can't understand. I stop looking beyond the mark. And as a result, what is plain and precious, my plain old life is no longer hidden from me. Oh, that's a good place to stop. Thank you. I love, all, I love all of that. That just felt like a great way to sort of set up the entire rest of the book with this 
um, there's this paradigm that like our, that basically everything holy is already here, you know, and, and we can have this experience of living in Christ in our regular life. But I, I'd love for you to just talk about, you know, what it actually looks like, like when you wake up in the morning, like how, how is this idea of being alive in Christ different than just going through the motions? Like what, what feels different? And, you know, maybe it's not something someone would even see from the outside, but like what, what's different in your mind and in your heart, if you're living a life in Christ? How is it, how is it done? Is the question. You're asking. Is it done? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That, that um, remains my question uh, as well <laughs> as I, as I tried to do it. Um, it's something like a manner, a posture, an orientation, right? It's, it's something like a way of holding what happens to you, right? It's something like a disposition. It manifests as a kind of feeling or, or affect, uh, but it manifests as the, as the kind of grounded sense that the way things are right here and right now is the only way they can be right here and right now. And that my responsibility is not to wish for something else or imagine something else or regret being in this particular place, uh, but that my responsibility manifests as the necessity of caring for things as they are right now, yeah. regardless of whether that was what I wanted or thought I wanted or wasn't what I wanted. Uh, all of those, all of those, all those normal kinds of uh, feelings and projections and worries and fantasies are, are irrelevant yeah. to the thing that actually needs to be done. There are two things in play, I think. On the one hand, there's the way that this constant fear of missing out, which is not a bad name for it, right? But our, uh, our contemporary acronym for this anxiety <laughs> at the heart of human existence, uh, right? the FOMO, <laughs> that constant fear of missing out on being something or having something or getting something uh, is at the root of what's problematic for us as human beings because it's the thing that prevents us from from showing up and offering the kind of love that things as they are actually need, right? It's, it's at the heart of thinking that love is about becoming a certain kind of person who can be loved rather than love being about being the kind of person who can manage to love. And being the kind of person who can manage to love is being the kind of person who can show up where they're at and give what's needed regardless of what they thought they wanted. <laughs> Mm. Uh, yeah. but the other part of the story is, is and I'm, I don't want to downplay here too much uh, the extent to which goals and ambitions uh, can be valuable and important but I think there's a way in which too that, that if we can manage to show up and give ourselves to, to what needs to be done right now without worrying about so much about the future part of what happens is that we can set our ambitions free we can liberate our ambitions from the burden of having to make us happy, right? And in lots of ways, when I set my ambitions free from the burden of having to make me happy, I become uh, empowered to achieve those ambitions in a way that I wasn't before. If I'm on the free throw line at the end of a basketball game uh, with the tie, you know, the score is tied and I think to myself, my happiness is going to hinge on whether I make this shot or not. That's not a good, that's not a good place to be in terms of making the shot. <laughs> yeah. If I can think to myself, man, I love playing basketball and I'd like to make this shot, but you know, whatever happens, I'm going to do whatever needs to be done next. Uh, then number one, my happiness doesn't hinge on making the shot, which is good because I might miss it. Uh, but number two, I'm much more likely to make the shot if I haven't pinned my happiness on achieving the ambition. Or if you're, you know, I think about my, my college students uh, all the time, if they're, uh, because I met my wife in a, in a class not so different from the ones that I teach, if, if they're sitting next to a girl in their, uh, in their class and they, 
and they think to ourselves, man, I, I really want to ask this girl out. Uh, this could, it could be really good. Uh, you know, if, if we, if we manage to get together, uh, but they think to themselves, uh, all of my happiness is going to hinge on whether she says yes or no. That's no recipe for speaking, you know, for having a conversation with her that will result in getting her phone number. <laughs> right? <laughs> if you want to succeed in the ambition of getting her phone number, you can't pin your happiness on how the conversation is going to turn out. Right. Uh, so that there's a sense in which I think two things happen simultaneously when we stop pinning our happiness on, on achieving these kinds of future goals is that one, we become capable of, of joy right here and now. Mm. Uh, because it depends on my loving, not my, not my love, not my, not my being loved and getting what I thought I wanted. But number two, I also set my ambitions free in a way that uh, makes me more likely to achieve them because my happiness doesn't depend on them. Yeah, I think this has this has implications for, um, or I- implications from sort of developmental psychology, right? Like, I think in in a sort of achiever focused stage your happiness is pinned on the future of of achieving and i think when i first started reading and learning about about developmental psychology i thought okay so after the achiever stage you leave behind achievement and you no longer you no longer need or have those ambitions or goals but it, i think this is what you're saying that's not, that's not true at all it's just that there's a detachment of the as the bhagavad gita might put it the uh, the fruit of the work from the work itself you have a right to the work but not not to the not to the fruit of the work, and in that way you sort of transcend, but also include. Like we do have a responsibility in many, and we have many responsibilities in our lives, and we have um, and we should have goals and ambitions. It's not about leaving goals and ambitions behind. It's about saying, like like you were saying, uh, my happiness doesn't doesn't depend on the outcome on the outcome here. And counterintuitively, yeah, I just love what, I just love what you said. Counterintuitively, that makes us more likely to achieve it in the in the first place. Yeah, this is the more often we can bring the, up the Bhagavad Gita, uh, the better, <laughs> uh, I think. Uh, but that's it's well said uh, in the Bhagavad Gita, and it's well said as you put it here. It has to do with allowing things to be ends in themselves, rather than just means to an end. Yeah. Uh, and there's a kind of liberation that occurs, uh, yeah. both in my both in my relationship to the ends, but now in relationship for me to the means, because yeah. the means become valuable in and of themselves. I'm doing things for their own sake, not just for the sake of what I hope to get out of them. Yes. And I'm more likely to get things. I'm more likely to get good things out of them when I do that way. But also, that's not the point uh, yeah. anymore. Yeah. I, just to. It may very well be the case that, you know, that the kinds of ambitions I do pursue change very much depend, you know, when I undergo this kind of change, uh, though, maybe not, maybe not. Right. Yeah. Just to, to add one, one more mundane example, going back to that, I, I've, I think there have been a few times and I don't regularly achieve this, but where I have done the dishes in Christ, as you would put mm-hmm. it, where my, all that was. Is that important. true, Aubrey? Or? <laughs> Um, but to be all that was important in that moment, you know, I was able to somehow get into a frame of mind where, and maybe it's not a frame of mind, maybe it's a frame of heart where the the only thing that mattered was doing the dishes. And it like at the end of a long night, you know, when you're busy and you're, you've got to get it done so you can go to bed so you can get some sleep so you can get up early and, and get things done. Like all of that stress of like doing the dishes for that purpose impedes that purpose but if you can do the dishes simply for the sake of doing the dishes it almost becomes a holy experience and something changes in your mind and in your body and your heart and then when you're done and you go to bed the sleep is different the the going to bed itself is different in a way that achieves your goal of being refreshed and ready for the next day and you know in a much more uh, uh, uh just in a much more adequate way you know for what you were trying to trying to get get out of it you know yeah this, this book looks like light reading. It's like what, 70, 80 pages, but it is, it, there is something, there's like an intensity and a depth that, that is, that stays with you. It's just been, and, and for that reason, exactly that for me, that, that Tim mentioned that it's something that is 
on my mind now, like, you know, as I go through the normal day and there, there, it was just such a cool experience to, to try this over and over, like to choose presence and to choose doing this activity for its own sake, instead of as a, a box to check or to, you know, something to finish, to get to the next thing. Like that experience in itself was, a, became, these became like such spiritually connecting experiences and they were so mundane. Like they're, they're just so small. And, and it was just like, it reminds, it reminds me of what president Nelson said about changing your breath. When he talks about repentance, how it should change your breath. Like it felt like that. It felt like such a deep shift in orientation that, that all of these little activities became just peaceful, restful experiences for the first time. So I second everything Tim said. Um, and I want to let you comment on that, but I, I want to ask specifically too about, about, so this, so I felt like I was having this experience of, of realizing the way that desire or even like our experience in relationships, like all of these things can be types or symbols for Christ. But the, one of the more challenging parts for me in the book was where you talk about the way that the law itself can be tempting or that we may abuse or, or make the law itself an idol. So I, I would love for you to just take a minute and talk about that. Like talk about how we can in the same, you know, it, with the same accidental intention of, you know, just being perfectly obedient actually be sort of like living in sin, you know, like li living in a way that is actually separating us from God. Even if we may be technically keeping the letter of the law with perfection. Yeah. Yeah. To go back for, for just a second before I take a crack at that, uh, your, your description of what, of what that experience is, what that experience was like, right. In, in Christ as a kind of, uh, rest, I think, is is dead on. Right? This is what the scriptures describe as entering into the rest of the Lord, right? Uh, this is the kind of thing that's uh, meant to be modeled for us on a weekly basis by way of the Sabbath, right? Where the Sabbath is kind of a weekly crash course in, in doing things for their own sake, not for not for our sake, yeah. right? Not for the sake of what I can get out of them. And learning how to, to, to live that way through the rest of the week, through all the other moments and all the other hours and all the other days. Uh, that's what learning to live in Christ looks like, right? To continually come back to that rest, to continually put down at his feet the burden of our ambition and frustration and, uh, and just allow joy to arise in what we're doing for its sake, for the sake of the people that, that we're with and, and what needs to be done. Yeah. Uh, but that dovetails uh, neatly with the question about the nature of the law. I mean, I think as Latter-day Saints, we're no strangers to uh, experiencing God's law as a source of deep frustration and regret and uh, anger and anxiety. Shame. Yeah. <laughs> Shame. No. Yeah. Guilt, right? All of those things are, are manifestations of this same kind of a uh, very destructive relationship to the law. And we can, we can describe what's going wrong there, I think, very simply in the terms that uh, Tim was using just a couple minutes ago, is that what happens is that I try to use God's law as a means to an end, rather than as an end in itself. I'm trying to use God's law to get to heaven or earn his love or get other people to approve of me or whatever I think is at stake, right? I'm trying to use the law as a way to get someplace else and be someone else uh, and have something that I don't have, right? The law itself, my relationship to the gospel is just another version of uh, my fear of missing out, right? I show up at church and I sit in the pew shaking with anxiety and, uh, and frustration as a result of what I may miss out uh, on in the next life, for instance, you know, for Pete's sake, not just what I may be missing out on, uh, on right here and now, when the whole point of the law is to, is to orient me in exactly the opposite direction, right, to point me down and in toward the law as an end in itself. And using the law as an end in itself uh, is just what Jesus means when he says again and again that the, all of the law, all of the prophets, it all hangs on the commandment to love. If you're using the law to love, which is something that you can only do in the present tense, not in the past, not in the future, then you're using the law as an end in itself and not as a means of getting something for yourself. 
Um, and when you use the law that way, it's liberating. It's liberating and the burden is lifted and you're forgiven and you're forgiving. Uh, and you don't feel the burden of all that guilt and shame because none of it's about you even anymore. Uh, and life itself sparks. Um, it's filled with the kind of fire and intensity and joy that uh, can't be present when we're always trying to use the law to be someplace else rather than here, to earn love rather than give love. Love that. Uh, I love um, that. One of, maybe, could we, would you mind doing another reading, Adam? No. I mean, so, no, I wouldn't mind. Okay. <laughs> that would have been a very terse. No. Oh, um, that's it. We're done. <laughs> um, so this one's chapter 22. I have it page 65. I'm not sure if that's what you have. Um, it begins with, I've spent a lot of time trying not to be weak. Yeah, I've, I've spent a lot of time trying not to be weak. I've spent a lot of time trying to put myself beyond the need for care. I've worked hard, I've exercised, I've earned degrees, I've written books, I've bought new clothes and more clothes, I've driven new cars. These things aren't bad in themselves, they can be good. They can in fact be done with care. They can be undertaken as acts of love, as means of service. But as a rule, I haven't done this. I've treated these things more as idols than as occasions for care. I've pursued them as props for projecting a fiction of worthiness, independence, and strength. But I'm tired, so tired of pretending not to be weak. I'm tired of pretending I'm not going to die. I'm tired of pretending I don't need Christ. If I'm serious about Christ, then my only hope is to let these idols die. My only hope is to practice living with as much care and patience and attention as I can. In this sense, Care is the work of no longer pretending to be strong. Care depends on finally being honest. Yeah. So do you, you reuse the word care um, from this point. I mean, it, from this point on, but throughout, really throughout the book. Could you talk about the way you think of that word? You know, what, what, what does it mean to care? Yeah, I kind of I introduce it as something like... Uh, a technical term uh, at the end of the book here to describe what this life in Christ feels like, that it's characterized, it has the manner of a sort of care. You do everything that you do with care. Um, it's a nice word in, in a lot of ways. It has, it has the resonance of, of taking care, right? It has the resonance of being careful uh, that has that resonance with the uh, with the Latin term caritas, uh, which is uh, you know the Latin version of what we tend to translate in the King James Bible as charity, right? Care is a name here for charity. Yeah. Uh, what does charity actually look like? I think it looks like it looks like care. It looks like taking care. The pure love of Christ involves my always doing everything that I do with care as an expression of care or again to come back to to the really useful i think way of talking about this that we've used a couple of times already doing something with care means doing something for the sake of itself <clears throat> right i'm not rushing through to get to whatever thing i hope to get out of it but i'm doing whatever i do with care for its own sake yeah, yeah. Love i really that. love that word too like it's just such a quick check like you you it can imagine that word and like immediately sort of reorient into something that that feels spot on you know it's the opposite mm -hmm. of rushing and hurrying it's like in in any situation imagining doing it with care just it, it's easy to think of what that looks like in any context it's like eye contact and slowing down or you know making something beautiful like i i just feel like it's something that works in every situation it was a, i love that i love that word to sort of like leave you with at the end of the book like this all comes down to living your life with care in every situation yeah but i want to ask you about ordinances specifically because i think this is something that where where this is kind of i i feel like this would be so useful to take into the temple or to take on a sunday where we're doing things that we do over and over again that might be easy to start feeling dismissive about because they feel they can feel arbitrary so how, how do you feel like rituals and ordinances kind of help with this, 
this idea of connecting through care and and through sort of like this transcendence of time like what what's happening there because I think this can be like a really this can be kind of a pain point like this is a hard way to feel like there's something valuable happening here every single time and can I just jump in right before you answer Adam too and say I had a so it, this totally relates to the ordinance question it is the ordinance question but in this paragraph that you just read you said I'm tired of pretending I'm not going to die and I recently had an experience where I got very sick. Um, I'm just thankful, and I know this is not everyone's experience, that I've m- mostly recovered and I'm, I'm feeling good. But as I sort of descended into the depths of my illness, I began to feel this really radical resistance to dying. And it became a, really a mental, a mental health issue where like um, the worst part about being sick for me was not the physical ailment, but it was the resistance that I felt toward biologically dying. Um, and it was really a scary sort of experience. Um, you, when you, I think when you say this, I'm tired of pretending I'm not going to die. I think you, you know, you, I, I imagine that there's a literal aspect to that, but there's also um, a figurative aspect and the way that you sort of weave in how ordinances can help us overcome that that fear of death I thought was really beautiful so I just wanted to throw that out there before you dive into ordinances uh well thanks for thanks for sharing that um I mean you know of course at one level you you should resist dying (laughs) (laughs) and continue doing that (laughs) that's fair uh but you know at, at another level and in a different kind of way uh a lot of what we do all day, every day is meant to project, create that, uh, that image, that facade of, of sufficiency, of strength, uh, of control. Uh, and at the end of the day, there is no more definitive sign of the fact that we are not in charge <laughs> and we aren't in control. Yeah. Uh, we don't have the strength that we claim to than that the fact we are going to die. Uh, We live our lives in denial of death. When Christ lived his life in exactly the opposite way, with his eyes wide open to death all around him, with his eyes wide open to the necessity of dying himself, even as God himself. This... I think is also at the as you as you indicate this very question is also at the heart of of our experience of rituals here, uh, especially in in our own tradition, as those rituals are elaborated uh, beyond baptism and into the temple. Though baptism may be the best and most accessible uh, example of how these kinds of rituals work, uh, as Paul describes it in the New Testament. The symbolism at the heart of baptism is death, uh, which is why that you need to do baptism by immersion, right? If the primary symbol uh, in baptism was just uh, was cleansing or washing, then you wouldn't need you wouldn't need immersion, mm. right? You need immersion because the primary symbol at stake in baptism is burial. Mm. Right? You have to be buried under the water, uh, so that as Paul puts it, your old man of sin can die. Uh, crucified with with Christ, and then you can ascend, arise, resurrected out of the water with Christ. In this sense, the ritual is a way of enacting early, before you die, your own death, so that you can get it out of the way, (laughs) right? So that you don't have to wait until the next life for your new life to begin because you already signaled by way of baptism that your life was over, that you weren't going to pretend that you weren't going to die, that you would die with Christ, putting your life in his hands, and that the, that the life that remains to you, even in this world, let alone the next one, is now already his. Uh, and the point then is, is to live that way, to keep that promise uh, until, both, you know, while we're here and, and uh, hopefully in the life to come as well now the specific the specific symbolism of baptism plays into that and of course the specific symbolism uh, at stake i think 
uh, at the heart of, of our temple rituals also feeds directly into that. Uh, but apart from the symbolism, just the sheer, the sheer practice of the rituals themselves, uh, those rituals are designed, I think, as speed bumps in effect, right? <laughs> uh, that force us to slow down, which is why we may find them sometimes uh, frustrating and, uh, and boring uh, and uh, uh, wishing, you know, is this, uh, is this endowment session ever going to end or not? Yeah. <laughs> you yeah, may well, think to yourself is, or, yeah. or a sacrament meeting or, or whatever, right? Because we're trying to get point. past it. We're trying yeah, to like, exactly. yeah. Yeah, yeah the whole point of the ritual is to force you to, to stop wishing that you were someplace else and practice yeah. for a few minutes here doing something for its own sake. Wow. And in that sense, you know, the kind of a, I wouldn't say that the, that the nature of the, the rituals is arbitrary necessarily, especially insofar as they're pegged to these kinds of symbols of fundamental importance for human life. But I think it is fair to say that, uh, that ri those rituals tend to be, they, they're conventional in character, right? Which is to say they could unfold differently. You could do them in a slightly different way. You could maybe do them in an entirely different way. Uh, and this is something that I think we've seen, you know, especially in the past 10 or 15 years as, as, the, as the endowment ceremony has, has undergone all kinds of shifts in terms of the conventions that we use to unfold the ceremony. Uh, but that, the conventional character, I think, also just drives home the point that if you're looking for something special or magical or mysterious or, or more uh, than the world of which you are a part, if you're looking for rituals to provide you a kind of escape from your responsibility to the everyday ordinary world, then again, you've missed the whole point. They're, they're not going to take you someplace else. Though they might, they just might, if you and I can pay attention and do them with care, they just might help us to be where we are, uh, which again, of course, is the only place where God is. Yeah, I love that. And I, there, there have been times in my life where it, when I've sort of dis descended into, you know, criticism, where I've rolled my eyes at the specificity with which we um, conduct our rituals and just, it has seemed very arbitrary but your reframing of baptism and, and then combining that with sort of your reframing of the laws that the, the, the law is the servant of, of love, right? Makes sort of our insistence on immersion make so much more sense to me. It's like, this is like, it's, it's almost as if, you know, Christ is, is screaming like, this is for you, you know, like we're doing it this way because I'm trying to show you how you can, you can die to yourself yeah. and, you know, arise in, arise in me, you know, and, that and take that powerful symbol into a new way of, of living like that that sort of way of approaching it makes me so much more excited about baptism and the way we do baptism you know so yeah thank you yeah. yeah and there's something there's something important though too i think about the the conventional slash arbitrary nature of, of in part of how we do it because that's that's also the only place where love happens right the fact that the fact that you're your five-year-old comes to you and says, I need to read this particular book again for the 2000th time. Uh, and you think to yourself, Father in heaven, please. No, not this book again. I will read any other book with this child, but not this book. Uh, why this book? Why does this have to be the one? Uh, in some sense, her choice of that book is arbitrary. Yeah. But in another sense, your willingness to read it with care anyway is the thing that makes it care, wow. right? The fact that it's not some special book that really does require your attention, uh, but just this same arbitrary book that for some reason she's attached to, no matter how terrible it is, you read it again anyway. Yes. That's, yeah. that's where the rubber meets the road. Yeah. I, I really agree with that. I've thought, of, <laughs> totally. I, I've thought about that in terms of, in terms of like priesthood blessings too. Like at times, again, in, in life, it's, it, I've said like, sort of to myself, you know, it, would God really mandate that, you know, we, you know, put the drip of oil and, you know, somebody says these specific words with hands on head and somebody else comes in and, you know, it's just, it, it seems like such a complicated and arbitrary process in some ways, but it channels, it's, it, it's almost as if by going through 
those complicated motions are the, the love that we're showing by doing them channels the faith, you know, maybe necessary to make a difference yeah. in some way. Yeah, we need, we need those forms, right? And I think in particular, we need those forms to guide us when we're trying to do things that are not in our own name, right? If I'm trying to do something that's not just my own action, then I need something that's going to force me to act in ways that I wouldn't normally act if I were just acting in my own name, right? I need a kind of, I need a kind of uh, a pattern uh, for my actions to align with, for those actions to no longer be mine, uh, a pattern that I'm not the source of. Uh, and even if that pattern is in some sense arbitrary or conventional, at least uh, in ways, uh, that pattern matters because it allows me to get outside of myself in performing the thing on behalf of someone else who I am not. Yeah. Love that. Wow. Can you, can you talk about the, like the first, I just keep thinking, but like, what about the first and second commandment? Because to me, it's always kind of felt like the differentiation between those two commandments, like the point of the differentiation is to explain how you can't always choose to show, you can't always choose love. Like if you're always loving your neighbor, like maybe you're going to be out of alignment with the first commandment. And I feel like sometimes we hear it, it talked about like that. And, and so it causes a lot of dissonance because what feels you know, more comfortable and like life-giving to me is just, is, is collapsing the two. Like we can, we show our love of God by loving our neighbor. And, and so I, I just would love to hear your thoughts about that. Like, I, I love this idea that, that in the same way that the Sabbath is, was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, that the, the law is made to help us express this love. And sometimes it feels like all of our energy gets funneled into just keeping the law So I just, but I think it gets, I think where the snag is this, like this idea of the first and second commandment, not being, you know, being two commandments. So how do you, how do you reconcile both of those? I have a hard time coming up with any actual scenario in which loving my neighbor would in some sense contradict an expression of love for God. Do you, do you have one in mind? I mean, this is the kind of thing that, that we say okay. sometimes, but I, but I suspect yes. that, I suspect that ultimately uh, we're not, we're going to have a hard time coming up with any actual examples. Yeah. So, okay. This is what I, this is why I'd love to hear you talk about it. Like, I think that it's often, I think it's this first and second commandment is used to justify actions that don't look like, like love. And I, I feel like someone might say like, okay, I can see this example happening in the LGBT community. Like in an effort to love God first, I'm going to have really hard boundaries around ways that this, these, are, these people should be living. So, so there's one example, but I, I, I just feel like it's kind of the fallback. Like it's the go-to to justify something that might not look like love. Yeah. Yeah. A lot depends. A lot depends on what we mean, of course. <laughs> a lot depends on what we mean yeah. by love. Um, I don't want to. Den- I don't want to deny that things can get complicated. I don't want to deny that. We may not infrequently find ourselves with competing and not entirely compatible obligations to the people that we love and the promises that we have made. But I think love, love understood rightly has got to be something like my doing whatever is best for that person. They may not agree, (laughs) right? And, or I could be wrong. (laughs) Right. Mm -hmm. In terms of my efforts to do, as I understand it, under God's law, what is actually best. Um, But that's that's what love looks like. It looks like doing what's best for them. Uh, You know, and we're all we're all struggling and working continually to understand more clearly what that is and, and how to do it. And especially when our obligations compete with one another. Uh. But if I'm actually doing what's best for them, if that's the way in which I'm loving them, then uh, even if it's hard or difficult at the moment, then that's, that's not going to be incompatible with loving God. 
because that's all he wants, right? This is all he commands. All he commands is that in every instance, I do what is good for whoever I am with, whether that person is uh, my friend or my enemy. The commandment is unilateral. I must do whatever is good for them. Yeah. I I, wonder if- I feel like, I was gonna say, I feel like it is a really powerful shift in paradigm to just remove like the future reward from the table. Like it, it gets more complicated when you're trying to calculate like the pros and cons of every action. And I, I think there is something really powerful about just like taking the moment as it is and, and acting with great care. Like that, that really seems to like simplify these very complicated situations. Well, that, it, it can, <laughs> it can, it uh, can, though sometimes, sometimes not. Yeah. In lots of ways, none of this is rocket science, right? Loving other people. <laughs> Uh, it's not rocket science and 99 times out of 100 you and i know exactly what we should be doing and how we should be doing it uh and it doesn't require any great thought or or or, or uh you know theoretical uh, uh reflections on, on the nature of, of what's needed right we know what to do and it's a question of it's a question of paying attention and doing it uh, that does always need to be supplemented by a spirit of discernment Right, we all we have the law here in hand uh, to help to help guide us and, and frame our work in these efforts, and we and we need to pray to be filled with the Spirit to know uh, how, with discernment and care, to apply those laws. And and there are cases in which we don't know what to do or how best to do it, uh, and then we have to we have to try even harder and pray even harder and, and be even more more careful. Uh, yeah. But most of the time, we know exactly what to do, uh, and there's no doubt about it. And uh, because yeah. the law is the law is pretty clear most of the time. It is that it is that one time out of a hundred, I think, that can really cause a lot of consternation. And yeah. and it should and yeah. it should. And I wonder, I wonder, and I don't think this is some great insight, but it, it does seem to me that faith and charity are often linked and spoken of together in the scriptures often. And, uh, you know, maybe, maybe that implies, I, to me, faith has sort, has sort of taken on, the word faith has taken on an element of uncertainty as I've sort of moved throughout life, almost to the, almost to the extent that when I hear faith, it always comes along with, with a, healthy, a healthy dose of uncertainty. And so as I, was, as I was listening to you speak, I was thinking, we do, we absolutely want to do what's best for whoever it is that we're interacting with we want to act lovingly toward them and maybe if we involve faith with that love it means that we're sort of uncertain in our judgment about what may be what may be best and what does that what does that look like it looks like as you said prayer certainly looking seeking for discernment but I also think it it also probably looks like listening to that person because a lot of times there's more going on than we are currently able to understand you know based on a surface level judgment you know yeah, to do to do what is best for them is always to offer what they need, and no one is going to be better at telling you what they need than than they are. That's uh, really well said. Let me ask you this: I I think sometimes our religion, and probably many or all close to all religions, can be very future focused. Um, I've spoken over the years to many people, and I've also felt this at times that like I'm worried about what heaven looks like, you know, I'm worried about what the next life looks like, you know, and in many cases, it's because, you know, there's been a, a child that's fallen away, or there's a broken marriage or a complicated, uh, you know, a complicated relationship scenario. And there are these images of um, empty seats at the table in this future, in this future world. Is there, is there a way that time can be reoriented by Christ in favor of, in favor of people who are worried about the future well i think it's a question of which which direction time is flowing here it's a question of whether or not i'm constantly flowing out of the present moment into the future right escaping the present moment being distracted from the present moment wishing that i weren't in this moment but someplace else doing something else Right, that's, the, that's the kind of normal direction in which it flows. Uh, 
it's supposed to, I think, flow in the other direction in which my care for the future continually flows into my sense for what is best and needed right here and right now, right? My care for the future continually informs uh, what I discern as what I should be giving right here and right now. Uh, and when that happens, then the future doesn't become a burden, right? The future empowers us to act in the present rather than the future becoming a kind of burden that stifles our capacity to, to give in the present. Uh, and it's this, I think, that's, a, that's what's at stake in experiencing my resurrection, not just as something in the future at some future date, but allowing my resurrection to begin in a very real, very substantial, very embodied way right here and now before I die and leave this world, right? Allowing that future to flow right back into my present and forming it, shaping it, filling it. Uh, leaving the burden then of the future to Christ uh, and taking up with him the yoke of the present moment. That's, that's where the rest is at. Yeah. I, I, I think one of the things I love most about this book is that you're, you're very serious about this. You're not using, you're not using these terms, death and resurrection, you know, metaphorically in order, you know, in order to make a point, you're like, you actually mean that there, there is a very real way in which we can die and, and, and be resurrected as soon as we, as soon as we choose, as soon as we give ourselves to Christ. Yeah, I think in the flesh, in the flesh, if it's not in the flesh, then I don't know what it is. It's beautiful. Thank you so much, Adam. This is just even more to think about. It's just incredible. I really, really loved the book, but love this conversation too. Is there anything that we missed that we want to, that you want to touch on before we wrap up? If this is for Easter, he is risen. Uh, the tomb is empty. Don't, don't look for him there. Uh, but you'll find him if you look resurrected in you you as his body manifests here in the world uh, step into it don't be afraid and run from it let him let him be the doer of your deeds and the speaker of your words and the thinker of your thoughts uh, and find the rest and peace and joy that, that comes from doing it wow thank you so much okay Thank you, Adam. This has been absolutely incredible. Yeah. Thanks so much for listening. We hope that you enjoyed this conversation with Adam Miller as much as we did. As always, if Faith Matters content is resonating with you and you get the chance, we would love for you to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you listen on. We read all of the reviews and it really helps us to get the word out about Faith Matters and we appreciate the support. Thanks for listening. Remember, you can check out more at faithmatters.org.